today's World Insight Special. Leaders of foreign business chambers in China gather to share insights on building open and win-win supply chains upon invitation of the China Council for the Promotion of International Trade. So what will it take to keep global supply chains free and beneficial to all? How can supply chain disruptions be kept manageable? In today's panel are Ran Hong Bin, Chairman of CCPIT, Siddharth Chatterjee, the UN Resident Coordinator in China, Julian Fisher, Chair of the British Chamber of Commerce in China, Lorenzo Riccardi, the Chairman of the China-Italy Chamber of Commerce, Vaughn Barber, Chair of the China-Australia Chamber of Commerce, and Lo Wei Kong, the Chairman of the Malaysian Chamber of Commerce and Industry in China. Now I really need the interpretation from every one of you to begin with. What is that exactly the open and win-win supply chain? Supply chain is like the vascular system of the economy. To have free and smooth blood circulation, we need to work together and ensure the circulation of the system so the global economy can grow in a healthy way. Let me give you two examples. First, Tesla's mega factory in Shanghai. As you all know, construction commenced in January 2019, and it was launched into operation by the end of the year, creating the Chinese speed and Tesla speed. This does not only speak to the enabling of business environment and policy environment in China, which is market-oriented, law-based, and world-class. It could also demonstrate to the strong supporting capabilities of upstream and downstream industries of electric vehicles in China, and is also a testimony to the industry as well as the efficiency of Chinese engineers and workers. So Tesla's mega factory in Shanghai has more than 95% in localization rate for parts and components. And there are more than 400 domestic tier 1 suppliers. In 2023, 950,000 electric vehicles were produced, accounting for 50% of Tesla's total output. And GE Healthcare in 1991 established the first joint venture in China. Now it has more than 600 CT suppliers, with more than 70% localization rate. Its output in China accounts for 50% of the global total. So these two examples show that foreign invested enterprises developed in China also rely on strong domestic industrial and supply chain capabilities and also integrity which enable their high quality and sustainable development surround the supply chain and with a reference to the current situation and also widespread concern of the industry there are lots of noises and also counter currents against the globalization and protectionism all this require to find a cooperative and inclusive development pathway to build open and win-win supply chains what about for international organizations like where you are, you know, for the United Nations, especially you are responsible for bringing all the UN uh, mechanism together here in China and work with China for prosperity, sustainable development? Mr. Chatterjee. Now, let me roll this back to what happened with COVID. You know, COVID hit us like a bolt of lightning. And in that flash of that lightning, we saw the contours of a global economic shock. That global economic shock rivals the Great Depression of the 1930s, and it's going to take a while for us to recover from it. More importantly, I was in Kenya at that time, and we saw the complete disruption of global supply chains, and which really upended economies globally, but not just that, loss of lives and livelihoods as a, as a consequence of that. So as the United Nations system, and particularly as the head of the United Nations here in China, I'm mindful of the reality that we have to do everything in 
with, with an efficiency with which we can actually make sure that we restore global confidence in the macroeconomic picture, but at the same time, make sure supply chains re remain open. So in a sense, it is vital that the multilateral system, such as the World Trade Organization, such as UNCTAD, such as ITC, remain fully committed and binded to bring the comity of nations to keep that thing open. And the Secretary General of the United Nations is absolutely clear. We need global supply chains to be open in order to achieve the sustainable development goals, which is perhaps the only North Star that we have. And therefore, the leadership of corporations, businesses, is going to be absolutely crucial in this new equation. I really like uh, the definition of the earth of the body. And I, and I consider... Well, everybody likes this uh, health analogy. <laughs> and I consider is the, the engine of a machine is the power of the economic development. So it's creating a cluster. But I believe today meaning is uh, related also to an important year. There is uh, an anniversary for CCP18. There is uh, an year to reboost the economy and uh, is a symbol for uh, opening up. I mentioned before with my colleagues how important it is for uh, China Italy Chamber of Commerce, for Italians and for Europeans to enjoy the new visa-free policy. We have 12 countries from Europe traveling visa-free. So from when this started, um, we notice immediately people traveling to China for personal interest, for cultural interest, for business. So we, we see and we meet managers, entrepreneurs, and they come to China and they bring new ideas. And this idea will bring new projects. So this is a symbol I consider also to test a new reform, a new tool for China to, to boost what is, uh, let's say, the heart of this body, the supply chain for global trade and for global investment. China and Italy, they are at the same level when we consider that we are cultural superpowers mm. for the history and for the culture. And I always like to remember that this year we celebrate 700 years from the death of Marco Polo. Oh. That is a symbol in trade mm. and is a symbol in bringing uh, like also economic value, not only cultural values, in sharing these ideas. So I think it's a, it's a very important year also for, for China-Italy relation. I guess I'd like to say that for me, supply chains and free trade are completely synonymous with one another. And, and we need to encourage more free trade. You know, it was about 250 years ago that the British thinker Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, in which he said that, you know, mercantile protectionist approaches were inefficient. You know, a generation later, we had David Ricardo, who said that, um, you know, comparative advantage, this idea that, that the more that we trade with one another, the more prosperous we will be as a globe. Um, the UK was obviously important with GATT after World War II, you know, which became the WTO. And in the British Chamber of Commerce itself in China, one of our values is the championing of free and fair and open markets. Uh, now, I mention all this basically to say that for us in the, in the UK, free trade is in our blood, and therefore we want to see open supply chains. But I think one of the challenges that's been raised here today, I think expertly by Madame Dilma Rousseff, is this idea that how do we create frameworks and international organizations that are inclusive and fair, and I think that that is something that we're all going to have to keep discussing. It seems that people are not only interested in health today, but also the panel is interested in history. I'm sure philosophers will also pop up later in our conversations. Let me go to you, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Barber, coming from Australian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, my understanding is it means that companies can locate their functions, they can distribute their functions uh, around regions and countries based on where it's sufficient to do so, based on comparative advantage. But increasingly, there are constraints on how we can do that as companies and how we can achieve those objectives. The first, of course, um, are the fact that international supply chains are governed by regulations uh, covering whether it's uh, data, uh, environment, uh, food safety. Uh, but beyond this, uh, a number of the panelists have already mentioned um, the pandemic and geopolitical tensions have heightened uh, awareness of risks and vulnerability in our highly interconnected global value chains. And this has given rise to governments 
uh, around the world, including in Australia and in China, uh, enacting policies to strengthen economic and national security. The intent is to, you know, while that's obviously going to increase costs and increase complexity, um, there, those steps are seen as necessary to build economies that are more resilient and can deliver long-term prosperity to their citizens. So it certainly means that certain activities are going to have to be located uh, locally, with investment being made in people and in infrastructure locally. Um, and that's going to be key, I think, going forward to what is understood as win-win supply chains. It's giving benefit to the investors, but it's also giving benefits to local economies. Supply chains should be used to optimize the production and distribution, transportation of a product from the factory to consumers. But due to some political reasons or security considerations, we do not have a balance. This is a loss to the whole civilization. Since the supply chains are blocked, then we should step up our efforts to invest in new technologies or new production capacity. Secondly, we can upgrade Tier 2 suppliers into Tier 1 suppliers to replace the suppliers cut off because of decoupling practices. Mr. Liu, you earlier yes. touched on the importance of reorientation. Uh, yes. And also to re, uh, how shall I say, re-energize the yes. conversation and actions. Yes. So what can be proposed in that regard? Uh, okay, uh, Malaysia is a part of uh, uh, RCEP um, members, so we should make full use of this uh, RCEP uh, platform um, to be part of the supply chains in the whole ecosystem. Uh, we know with this uh, RCEP, uh, a lot of uh, trades um, can move easily without tax, without any trade barrier. So this is a very good platform for those uh, industries to be part of the whole supply chain system. Which stage do you see that UK is now taking advantage of all these incentives and policies and now going on in China and rethink about you know, reorientation of a global supply chain to make it win-win and open. Yeah, I'll start by saying that I guess, you know, sustainable supply chains are very, very important in the UK, end-to-end -end sustainability and, and digital supply chain. So I think that's definitely an area of opportunity. I think, I think the one thing that I would highlight from a UK perspective is that we are a service-led economy. 80% of our economy is services. And I think that free trade and, and, and open supply chains don't exist without those business services. So you need insurance firms, you need accounting firms, you need law firms to make sure that supply chains can operate internationally. So from our side, that's the really, really important part of where we think there's complementarity between the UK and China. Um, I think that that has been challenging. I think definitely during COVID, we saw a dip in, in sentiment around a service industry that they were finding things a little bit more challenging. Um, but I think what we're also seeing now, I, I did speak to uh, our policy team who speak to our members regularly um, before this meeting, and they said that actually now a lot of the service companies are seeing positivity in helping Chinese companies going global. So I think that that's an opportunity for the UK economy here, is not just supporting British businesses and businesses within China, but it's now also supporting Chinese businesses going into National. Now, you also mentioned about sustainable development earlier in your answer. I want to hear more exactly what you meant and how is Australia looking at that in terms of trying to create and maintain win-win open supply chain? From an Australian perspective, I think a key focus is on um, the transition to net zero. And we believe that that's an area that's ripe for collaboration with China. Um, particularly with the bilateral relationship now stabilizing and improving. My key message is it's a good time for Chinese and Australian companies to be talking about uh, new opportunities in this area. In a way, it also echoes what Lord Zong said about finding a tupoko. For Australia, the tupoko is collaboration on climate change, and in particular in net zero, 
the three sectors I'd highlight. The first is um, in renewable energy. Australia has abundant renewable resources, whether it's sunshine, unlike the UK, uh, uh, or, uh, or wind, you've got a lot of that, politically as well. Um, um, sorry, I like the laugh there. So renewable collaboration in clean energy projects to help us go faster towards a green and sustainable uh, power grid. Uh, the second area is EVs and sustainable transportation infrastructure, where I think it offers a significant opportunity for uh, Chinese involvement. Now, recognizing our American friends over there, we don't have a car manufacturing sector in Australia, so um, Chinese EVs are doing quite well in Australia. And I see that the advantages that China has in technology, in scale, in cost, um, means that there's an immense potential for Chinese companies to partner with Australian companies in transforming our transportation sector. I said there were three sectors. The third sector is advanced manufacturing with um, a one of very detailed. So some of the areas, production and scaling of renewable hydrogen, critical minerals processing, battery production and recycling. There are Chinese companies already in Australia working on that and there are quality companies looking at those opportunities. Finally, China and Australia are working on projects aiming to produce green steel, which is a critical part of decarbonizing the steel industry, which is of course very interesting to China given the percentage of the uh, emissions generated from the steel sector. So in addition to what's been done in Western Australia, I heard about some exciting developments in South Australia uh, in the production of uh, green hydrogen and green steel when the governor of South Australia, our former ambassador to China, visited a couple of weeks ago. So bottom line, collaboration between Australia and China in net zero is ripe with opportunity. China brings technological advantages and cost advantages to the table. And by working together, Australia and China can not only accelerate the decarbonisation, accelerate um, transition towards a net zero future, but also give a powerful example of international collaboration in climate change. Great point. So you are suggesting, why don't we maximise the areas of common ground and take great advantage of that? Because there's enormous amount of space out there. And uh, interestingly, when you are talking, Mr. Barber, um, it reminds me if we could spend the same amount of time not inventing rhetorics, but inventing ways to work together and inventing ways to come up with the new technologies, that would be really wonderful. Um, go to you, Mr. Chatterjee. Um, sustainable development, uh, building on uh, the footsteps of uh, our Australian colleagues, I want to ask you also more about that. You know, you have been doing a lot of advocacy uh, in that regard and trying to bring different UN organizations now in China uh, toward some uh, uh, common and shared initiatives and actions. Can you give us more details about how these gentlemen, when they are talking about the supply chains and how businesses are interlinked with our societal responsibilities, what, which niche do you see they can take more advantage of, please? So Tianwei, you know, for the first time post the Second World War, we are seeing an interlocking crisis which the world has never seen before. We've had a health crisis, we have a climate crisis, we have a crisis of geopolitics, we have a crisis of conflict, we have a crisis of rising inequalities, we have a crisis of energy, we have a crisis of finance. It's just amazing. And, you know, we've reached a grim milestone where over 120 million people have been displaced because of climate instability, you know, yeah. poor governance, so poverty. So what we see is what the Secretary General is trying to do is provide hope, and that is why he's, he's having the Summit of the Future for this time, uh, UN General Assembly. And the Summit of the Future is really about resurrecting the spirit of multilateralism, really bringing the Committee of Nations back together to serve, to look with purpose at what we have all united for, the Sustainable Development Goals, which is by 2030, and we are completely off track. So he's talked about rescuing it. Now, what does it take? for us to kind of look at this whole ecosystem. And this resurrection of the multilateral system is not just governments alone. It is going to take corporate leaders. It's going to take companies, foundations, universities, every com everybody coming together. 
the disruption of supply chains should be a lessons learned for all of us in terms of why we need to rekindle the spirit of multilateralism. What I'm doing here, for example, as the resident coordinator of the United Nations in China is working very closely, for example, with the Africa group of ambassadors here. And we have an important initiative called the Transforming Partnership Initiative, where we are looking at a UN China Africa initiative to look at what lessons can we share from China, what partnerships we can share from China in terms of giving Africa the velocity in food security. I mean, just imagine, China has 9% of the world's arable land, and it feeds one-fifth of the world's population. Africa has 60% of the world's arable land, and it imports $300 billion worth of food. It's ridiculous. Africa should be the breadbasket of the rest of the world, where our population will be 10 billion by, by 2050 areas of, of, uh, of energy security and energy transition in Africa, uh, areas of climate financing in Africa. We see amazing opportunities there. And why am I saying this? Is what we are trying to do is work with the Chinese government, particularly when it comes to the Forum for China-Africa cooperation, to look at how do we actually end up implementing it. That's the work we are doing. And that's how the multilateral system has, has come into play. So as far as the UN here is concerned, what we are trying to do is set up this platform where we can convene, connect, and catalyze relationships for transforming the South-South aspect of cooperation. And certainly supply chain is a very important interlink uh, among all the economies. Uh, well, we saw with the disruption of supply yeah. chains, you know, businesses just went out of business. I mean, it includes businesses in China from small, medium uh, enterprises and businesses globally just went out of business just because of the disruption of supply chains. And what that reminds us is the criticality of partnerships here, is the criticality of despite geopolitics, I think that can be parked and we can focus on the areas that bring us together. Areas such as energy transition, the climate, areas on public health, areas on, 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 on infrastructure, there are plenty of areas where the world can collaborate on. First, over to Chairman Zhen. Would you respond to what we have said just now? And could you please brief us on the second supply chain expo? From the latest report, we can see that in recent years, especially over the last two years, China introduced a number of documents to stabilize and improve the business environment of foreign investors. Generally speaking, foreign chambers of commerce speak highly of the documents published by the Chinese government, especially the document published in August, and the action plans, which include 24 measures in six aspects, also include the flow of data. The Cyber Security Administration of China also issued regulations on cross-border data flow. The document also touched upon the treatment of foreign employees' family members and the education for their kids. We can see that over 95% of foreign businesses in China are satisfied with China's latest policies. One of the reasons is that China is more open after the pandemic. Both the central government and local governments are embracing foreign invested enterprises. This is why international organizations, including the World Bank and IMF, have upgraded their forecast of China's economic growth in 2024. This shows their confidence. Last year, we showcased five industrial chains, namely smart vehicles, clean energy, green agriculture, digital technology, and health life. There was also an exhibition area for supply chain services. This year, we will focus on new quality productive forces with an exhibition area for advanced manufacturing. That is, six industrial chains and one supply chain services expansion areas. We will showcase upstream and downstream innovations and the latest research outcomes. We will build a platform to exhibit the latest commercial arbitration services, tourist services, and financial services, among others. So how to enhance cooperation with China this year? I think you can focus on these six industrial chains and one supply chain. We will provide a stage for cooperation.
非常重要的舞台。So we wrap up today, but we'd love to have your brief uh, uh, takeaway from uh, today's discussion. I'm very optimistic about net zero collaboration. Seriously, the next step after that is that companies. Yeah. Uh, how to take how to take advantage, how to work with the policies to achieve uh, the goals that we're talking today mm. uh, of, of collaboration in these new areas, particularly green, digital, tech, healthcare, etc. Um, CCPIT and the Chambers of Commerce here have an important role to play, mm. uh, helping companies to understand those policies, to find partners, and to build trust in an ecosystem to work together and of course Australian companies look forward to uh, attending Lian Bo Hui and the other um, important exhibitions this year um, in China uh, and of course we will look forward to welcoming uh, CCPIT and its members to uh, come to Australia and do Xian Chang Kao Cha. I think it is clear that Collaboration is going to be the essence as we look at the advancements that we need to make in order to achieve the 2030 agenda. And for that side, for the, the United Nations and China, has a cooperation framework with China which spans 2021 to 2025, and we're already preparing for the next cooperation framework from 2025, 2026 to 2030. Yeah. I'm here to offer the United Nations platform to convene, connect, catalyze relationships both in support of China's uh, development ambitions, but at the same time forge alliances to support more South-South cooperation. We need to keep talking about free trade uh, in, in every country and in every government around the world because um, it's not always easy. It sometimes means that local jobs are lost. It sometimes means that small businesses can't survive because they have an international competition. But I think we all need to agree that it's important. And, and that applies to the UK government too. As I said, it's very important to the UK. And I think that we need to keep talking about free trade, but also making sure that we're acting it as well. But I think it's also important here because we know that when the government here talks about free trade and about openness and about importing foreign goods and working with foreign companies, that, that has a real impact on local government and on consumers too. So, so please keep talking because silence speaks words. And, and I think that when, when, when free trade is encouraged, it, it really, really makes a difference. Through today's meeting, we can see clearly that the Chinese government it's very clear about the direction moving forward, which gives us a great confidence in what we should do to follow up on related investments or stepping up efforts in certain sectors. Second, through colleagues from Chambers of Commerce as well as speakers earlier, we can see that humanity faces lots of challenges. But we can also see that there is great solidarity and concerted efforts towards the uh, good direction, so we have a very bright future. I believe uh, the most important thing is uh, our dialogue between uh, our companies, the members of these chambers, uh, and the institutions that are represented today. So we started with a new board with a very important meeting between our companies and uh, the Italian Minister of Economy, a dialogue showing what is important for our Italian companies in China. And we are glad today to join today dialogue uh, with Chinese institutions and also with the chairman of CCPAT. We want to do the same in uh, other provinces and uh, local markets uh, in an internal geography of China where we want to promote more interactions and uh, new cluster, new supply chain hubs. So I'm sure as all of you said, actions, solutions, and wisdom eventually count. Thank you so much. Thank you.